from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good evening, everyone. Wel welcome to the Library of Congress. I'm John Cole. I'm the director of the library's Center for the Book, which means I have the lucky job of promoting books, reading, literacy, and libraries on behalf of the Library of Congress. And uh, tonight we have a special treat, not only a special speaker, Lisa Scottolini, but also a number of guests who are with us uh, from other countries. They're visiting today and part of a program at the Library of Congress. Today we've announced our new 2015 Literacy Awards, which means the library is honoring organizations from around the world that have made achievements towards erasing illiteracy. It's an important five-year program funded by David Rubenstein, one of the library's benefactors, and it really recognizes not only three major groups that get cash prizes for the work they've done, but also best practices. These are the people who are with us today are the honorees, and there were 14 organizations honored uh, by the Library of Congress Literacy Awards this year, um, and 12 of them are represented today at the library, uh, several from overseas, to talk about their best practices projects. And this is a booklet which covers the, tells you the whole story, and I hope you'll take one with you when you leave. It talks about the awards, it talks about the winners, and each of our best practice winners who is here tonight knows very well from this afternoon's program, where they all presented information about their projects, that they each have a page and which describes their project, and we encourage them to use that page and to use the recognition by the Library of Congress to help further uh, literacy, their literacy efforts in their countries, but also to be part of this larger effort uh, to eradicate illiteracy by re-stimulating interest in literacy and literacy promotion uh, throughout our society. Now, a number of these people, Lisa, I'm sorry to say, may not know your books, but we also have friends and fans of Lisa's who have come to hear her introduce her new book, and we have managed to combine these two efforts because of Lisa's own support of the Library of Congress and her interest in our activities, and in particular, something I'm grateful for is her uh, support for the Center for the Book and its activities. Uh, the center was created in 1977 uh, by Daniel Borston when he was Librarian of Congress and he wanted the Library of Congress to reach out uh, to society to promote books and reading. This was before literacy was really even a hot word. And we, of course, became the natural place in the library for the Literacy Awards, just as we were the focal point for the National Book Festival when it was created in 2001 by First Lady Laura Bush, who, when her husband was elected uh, President of the United States, she was the First Lady of Texas and had created the Texas Book Festival. And she quickly said that it was her goal when she came to Washington was to create a National Book Festival and that, by golly, she was going to invite the Library of Congress to be the partner. And she said that immediately, and I'm so grateful she said it, because eventually, of course, not eventually, the following spring, we had the first National Book Festival. And her staff combined with Dr. Borston's staff, uh, including me, kind of headed by me at the time with the assignment of uh, getting the National Book Festival started, we did not have our first planning meeting until April in 2001, and the first book festival was held on the, in the grounds, excuse me, um, in the Library of Congress buildings, plus on the East Capitol grounds uh, on September the 8th. So we had about three months to plan, 
And we ended up, to our amazement and delight, having 30,000 people who flooded the Jefferson Building and this building. And we knew there never again should be one inside. But this was accentuated three days later with 9-11. And I thought there would never be another National Book Festival. But Mrs. Bush insisted, and Dr. by then it was Dr. Billington, who was Librarian of Congress, uh, immediately got in touch, and it turned out that Mrs. Bush said, yes, of all things, it's even more important to have a National Book Festival in a time like this. And it really is through the National Book Festival and the activities of the Center for the Book, actually, that I met Lisa. She probably won't remember when I think we first met, which was in Florida, when you were doing a talk for the Florida Center for the Book, for Jean Treby. You do remember. And I was visiting uh, with my wife, and we were, of course, as the honcho of the huge Center for the Book back in Washington, with Florida being our first center. It was important that I come go to some events, especially since it was in Fort Lauderdale. <laughs> and we met Lisa and had dinner with her and went to her presentation. and. Just about that time, the National Book Festival was getting started, and Lisa uh, became really, uh, we invited her uh, to the book festival, and she first came, and I actually looked this up as a librarian, <laughs> two, 2007 was your first National Book Festival. But the thing about Lisa that she, that I recall always was, first of all, she's a lawyer, and she chose to write mysteries, my wife, Nancy, was a mystery, still is a mystery buff. And so a lot of these worlds came together for me. And of course, I pretended like I knew lots of mystery writers. Well, I did know one, <laughs> for sure. And uh, she became a mystery writer with her writing career, began with her first novel, Everywhere Mary Went, which was published in 1994, before we had a book festival. It became a bestseller and was nominated for the Edgar Award, which is the most prestigious award given in crime fiction. Her second novel, Final Appeal, reached, received the 1995 Edgar Award. Today, she has written more than 25 books, many of which have appeared on bestseller lists. And just to take the last bit of the blurb, which is important, today more than 30 million copies of her books are in print and are published in more than 35 countries and 25 languages. Today, Lisa, we had a real international meeting, as you can imagine, with reports from these various countries about literacy and reading in, in their countries. And um, your books are in many of their countries, probably all of their countries. But she is a special friend of the library and our book festival. As I said, her first appearance was 2007. Um, and for one of her mysteries. Uh, you were also at the 2009, but what I really remember was the first time you came with your daughter. And so this was a new pattern that emerged with the 2012 Book Festival with her, as when, uh, she, when Lisa came and spoke twice, and this was a first for the Book Festival. Once as a mystery writer in our mystery, our, in those days we called it the Fiction and Mystery Pavilion, and the book was Come Home, uh, a second time in that same festival in uh, 2012 with Francesca, her daughter, in our newly created Contemporary Life, which was a wonderful pavilion for their joint book of funny stories and true confessions, which was titled Best Friends, Occasional Enemies, The Lighter Side of Life as a Mother and Daughter. Well, Mother and Daughter made another joint appearance this year at the National Book Festival. Uh, Lisa going it alone in mysteries, thrillers, and science fiction. We keep changing the pavilions because our book festival keeps expanding, and we're trying to get more genres, and, uh, but there's always, whatever pavilion Lisa is in always has the word mystery in it. <laughs> and that book was for every 15 minutes, and again with Francesca in Contemporary Life, and this time was for their latest together, which was titled does this beach make me look fat? <laughs> so you can see you have a skilled writer, a diverse writer in front of you, 
And uh, tonight, we, she will uh, be signing copies of her brand new book, which was just published today, and it is called Corrupted. Corrupted. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so uh, we're lucky that Lisa is with us. We're lucky to have our, our best practices winners with us. We've had a wonderful afternoon, an inspiring afternoon, I think, for many of us. And we know that uh, Lisa will for, uh, give us another form of inspiration. Then may I introduce Lisa Scottoloni. John, John, John. <laughs> so, how much do we love John Cole? Then we love John Cole. My God, let's hear it. This man is amazing. And Robert Newland and everybody who worked so hard. I am so honored to be here. Thank you so much. Congratulations to all of the winners and to all the best practices finalists. I am in awe. I am distinctly unworthy. I am your comic relief tonight. I can tell you, I, uh, I, I, I feel as if, though, um, maybe I have something to offer you because I think I always begin because you are all doing stuff that is so important and so, in my mind, mac macro, really. I want to take you to the micro a little bit because I think if I get this, this speech right, uh, I should be able to end up in a place where you understand at a very granular level, as everybody says these days, how very important you are. And I think an author might be the person to teach you that or just remind you of that. Because I come to you not only as an author, but more importantly as a person who loves books and grew up in a house with none. None. We had lots of hugs in South Philadelphia, <laughs> lots of meatballs, but one book. What do you think that book was? The Bible. Aren't you sweet? No. <laughs> no, I said it's South Philly where we keep it real, and the book was TV Guide. Nobody read in my house. Nobody read. No one saw the... It, uh, when I started reading, my mother said, please stop reading, you'll ruin your eyes. What are you doing? It was that kind of a vibe. They loved me a lot. But it was a school librarian who took, my fa took me aside and said to my... So did I tell your father to take you to a library? And there he took me to the library where he sat in the car like a dog because there was no TV in the library then. Now that there's TV in the library, maybe the Scottolini's had a fighting chance, but then he was there. And so I was in the library, and I was that kid wandering in the library, probably not unlike a lot of the kids you're helping, though the setting is different. Though I'm talking about Winfield, Pennsylvania, somewhere outside of Philadelphia, to me the setting matters not at all. Because somewhere there's a kid wandering in some library going, a, I'm intimidated, but B, I'm also a little in love. It's kind of like Bradley Cooper now that I just thought of it. <laughs> intimidated and also in love. How to reconcile, we don't know. But here I was in the library going, how do I pick a book? I don't know what to do. And in those days, you know, the cards uh, went with the books. People wrote, they wrote with something called a pencil. Something you may remember. Do you own one? No. But I remember picking at the, look at that nice handwriting. She looks nice. Maybe I'll get this book. But what really helped me choose books was on the spine, at a lot of the books, they had a, a, a person in profile with a really big nose. <laughs> the Scottolinis have really big noses. My mother says we get more oxygen than anyone in the room. And she's right. Like, if I breathe in, you could die. Like, it could be. <laughs> It was nice knowing you. But here I was, and I'm looking at that guy with that nose, and I'm going, you know, I'm, I'm feeling him. Like, he's a little Uncle Rocky. So I read all those books, and then at some point I find out that he's, his name is Sherlock Holmes. And that's why I'm a mystery writer today. I know, it's very glamorous. I really wanted to class it up for you guys, but obviously I have to tell the truth. Uh, but what, the important point about that, though, is that is where I found somebody that actually led me on a path that would take me here, amazingly enough, which was Nancy Drew. Can we talk about the girl detective? Because we need to talk about the girl detective. And I will tell you as an author that anybody who's worth your time writing anything is going to try to choose telling details, right? Now, if you think about what Nancy Drew had, she had, um, she had a best girlfriend, because we all have girlfriends, yay. She had a boyfriend, because she's not a middle-aged woman, just saying. <laughs> be real, let's be real. Is my bitterness showing? Good, fine, excellent. 
he had a father, kind of a benign presence. I think of him like Jimmy, Jimmy Stewart. Do you, does anyone know who that is? <laughs> Good, then we can keep talking. Excellent. And uh, she lacked a mother. Remarkable. Please note, to kill a mockingbird. There's a reason this happens. When there's not a mother in the picture, like my mother would have had her in a convent. <laughs> but the child can go on adventures and be on her own when there's no mother. Nancy Drew. The telling detail on Nancy Drew, if I may suggest to you, if you think about what you remember about Nancy Drew, isn't it the blue roadster? Remember the car? There's a reason for that. Go back in American history to the 1950s. See the USA in your Chevrolet. Go back to Brinks Bruce Springsteen. Even that is a dated reference, which is horrifying. Um, <laughs> like, what? But think of Thunder Road, right? These four wheels will take you anywhere. There's something about a car that we think of as quintessentially American. And Nancy Drew was in a car. And the most important thing about Nancy Drew in that very telling detail of a roadster is what? She's in the driver's seat. She is nobody's passenger. She is an American girl having adventures on her own. What's she doing? It, frankly, I'm just telling you, I'm here to tell you, it doesn't matter. Because all the plots are, she's, well, I'll tell you what the plot is. She's missing something and she has to find it. Okay, <laughs> everything's missing in the town in which she lives. The clocks are missing, the pencils are missing. There's a missing staircase, which I think is remarkable because I might misplace my, my phone, but I know where my staircases are. Like, I'm all over the staircases, but none of that matters. I can tell you as a writer, that's just the top line of the plot. You won't remember a Nancy Drew plot. What you remember is the girl and the roadster. And so here I am falling in love in the library going, I want to be her, I want, the, I want to drive like her, and then I grow up and I can have a lifelong love of reading thanks to librarians because though I was so deeply loved at home, I can't say that I was honestly understood. The place where they understood me was where the books were, was the librarians. And they gave me something called a library card in a time when I wanted mail. You know, I wanted a wallet filled with identification. I had nothing, but I had a library card. It was orange and stiff, and it had a little metal plate, right? My card number was 3839. Why do I remember that, and I don't remember where my cell phone is? I would go home and ink it. This is how geeky I was. I would ink it like this and like put it on things. Why? Why? Because I was pathetic, that too. But <laughs> because there's an emotional, the, it, the librarians and the library made for me an emotional connection with the book. That you remember what you are emotionally connected with. That's why I remember the things that of my life that really matter, and so do you. Because that library card was more than a library card. It was a passport. It said, you belong. Here's a club, and we love you. We don't think it's crazy you want to read your eyes out of your head. We think it's cool. And that's what libraries do for everybody, and that's why I get to sort of stand before you today. Not only did they give me a lifetime, lifetime love of reading and a career besides, but I feel like the best part of my career is sort of my secret message. Now, I don't say this often, but you brought it out in me, so it's all your fault. But when I started to become a writer, I thought, what can I contribute? What can I do? And I had been a lawyer. I loved being a lawyer. I only became a writer after my first divorce. Are you impressed yet? <laughs> you really should have had like Amy Tan or somebody who can stay married. But me, I was like, ah, what am I going to do now? You know, I'm a lawyer. I'm getting divorced. Like my child is very young. Like, I hesitate to say this, but I'm going to say this. My child was basically crowning at the time of the divorce was coming through. I have to, it's such a good verb, you can't really. <laughs> Come on, it's a great verb. That's where we were. So I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do next? Well, you love Nancy Drew, and by the way, you're still reading. And all the stuff you read, and not only in mystery, but I must say in crime fiction generally, and in popular fiction generally, you had to look very, very hard for the heroines. There were very few women main characters, and especially in crime fiction, because that's all about the testosterone, you know, and, and uh, weapons offenses. You know, there's major, and there's alcohol, and there's all this stuff, and none of this stuff I really related to, because I still miss Nancy True. And I said, where is that plucky American girl who's going like, to find the missing whatever? <laughs> I said, I guess you got to write that. And part of me thought, you know, look, I was a female lawyer. Like, wow, you have a, you have a law degree and ovaries. 
Think of it. It happens. So you had heard a lot about Perry Mason. Could we, you know, where's Della Street? We were still pouring coffee, and so I said, this must change. And there I embarked upon my main goal, which was to stay home with my daughter, I must tell you. Um, and so what I can contribute, maybe, is something about women main characters who may start out at lawyers, but what the cool thing about, especially that time, 1990s, um, was that women, part of what is amazingly charming about us is that we don't necessarily define ourselves by our job. If you think for a moment about Perry, Case, Perry Mason, he's a guy in a courtroom. He's a lawyer. If you watched Perry Mason or read Perry Mason, you never saw him outside of the courtroom. You don't even know if he had, well, he had a girlfriend because he kind of had Della Street, whom he led on unconscionably. But <laughs> he had no life. He wasn't, there was a cardboard characterization there that women don't have and didn't think of. Because when I started writing, I was like, well, wait, I'm a single mother. Uh, I'm kind of like, I was a lawyer, but now I'm this. What am I? What am I? What? And that leads you to the question of, you're going to write about what is a woman, and you're going to tell it true. Because as I always, my touchstone is always a great quote by Francis Ford Coppola, who said, the director, nothing in my movies ever happened, but all of it is true. Everything you write has to be emotionally true or literally true for it to connect, which I'll come back to later. In any event, I start writing, 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 writing. Um, I don't want you to think this is a great fairy tale because I was broke, 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 broke. And um, I got rejection letters from a New York agent that said things like, we don't have time to take any more clients. And if we did, we wouldn't take you. <laughs> I see that guy every year at Book Expo, where I was the keynote. <laughs> I know, revenge is sweet. And, I, and, and you know, I still, I see him, he's calling me. He's like, Lisa, I'm going, I don't hear you. I don't. <laughs> I don't hear you. Yes, because I my mother taught me to keep hate alive, and I do. So <laughs> I'm that petty, really. And um, so basically, I embark upon this writing life, which is wonderful and hard to get into publication. I'm living on credit cards. To fast forward through the story, my daughter uh, doesn't know that we're broke, but we can do because we live on credit cards and we pay like ten dollar a month. They increase your credit limit every time, like they think you're a crack addict, and they're fine with that. At 21%, exactly, <laughs> right, 21%, you could get money from the mob cheaper, and don't ask me how I know that. So <laughs> here I am, writing by day, getting rejected by night, nursing, the child, happy as a clam because I think I'm doing something really important, which is raising this amazing daughter, and also trying to tell stories about women because I wanted to see us in print. Uh, fast forward to when it finally gets published, not for a living wage. My daughter, who had lived in credit cards all her first six years, had to actually start to live within her means, which sucked. That's a literary term if you're not familiar. You try to keep up with this, okay? <laughs> Permit me one cute kid story. Because we lived on credit cards, we would go once a month to Chili's. You know what Chili's is, right? So she knew Chili's. Like, we would go to Chili's, and here's the menu, and here's you eat this, and she liked the, brown, the brownie sundae. It was a thing. Well, she had never been in a McDonald's because it was the dark ages and McDonald's did not take credit. Can you imagine how horrifying that would be? Okay, so that meant she was not going there because I did not have, as we say in South Philly, scratch. <laughs> so we're driving, she would want to go to McDonald's again. No, I don't like it, it's bad meat, it's like you can't. Fast forward to when I finally sell a book and we're going to McDonald's. She is delighted, her eyes are, she's never seen a place like this. It's like a, the, uh, you know, a child from the Ukraine has been taken and, Glistening surfaces, it's remarkable. And I say to her, but it's, it's not exactly like Chili's. It's a little different. You have to stand on the line. At this point, she's seven. That's how long it took me to get published. And she looks up at the menu. I said, the menu's up there. And she looks at it, and she says, um, but where are the appetizers? <laughs> Every head turns. Who's this little brat? Uh, I go, she's broke. She just doesn't know it. And that's sort of the stuff of it. You know, it's, you can't, it's not a sob story. It's, to me... I want to be the person who's exhibit A and says to you, and this is the kind of stuff I say at the National Book Festival, because I want not only the, chid, the kids, but the adults to hear how a book gets made and where it happens and why it matters. And so I am lucky enough now to write three books a year. I write the Rosado series, which stars an all-woman law firm. I still get the question, is there such a thing as an all-woman law firm? I go, well, yes, there is, because I will answer that question. I'll never, 
I might think things, but I'll never say it because I, part of what I'm doing, you know, no one wants to read a textbook and no one wants to read a lecture. My job is to entertain them and have it dawn on them slowly that these women are in control. They're driving the roadster. They're nobody's passengers. And by the way, the world didn't end. It kind of worked out nice and the curtains are a hell of a lot better. I mean, that's probably <laughs> sexist. But my point is this. Not to get ahead. Rosado is about those women. It's a series, and it's about women over time. And since I've been at this so incredibly long, I am actually examining power relationships and personal relationships between women over time. And I'm talking in real time. Like 20 years I've been writing about these women. So you're going to try to understand how is the world different when women run it, because that's what happens in those books. There are so many that I'd written a whole series of them, and then the, there is a little more of a more insecure partner. Let's think if she's, she has fake blonde hair and she's about 5'2", she's Italian-American, she grew up in South <laughs> Philly. Oh, wait, it's supposed to be fiction. Um, <laughs> That would be Mary D'Annunzio, who's sort of like my alter ego. And she was the insecure one who actually became a partner. So I had to reboot the series as Rosado and D'Annunzio. I started it at Accused. The next one last year was Betrayed. This is one is Corrupted. You see the pattern because you're smart people. <laughs> ABC. Because Sue Grafton is done with the, uh, the alphabet, and <laughs> there is no copyright on that, and ain't it great? In April, I write books which we call standalones. They tend to examine what is a mother. This is all the secret stuff I'm doing, right? This is, this is the stuff that matters, not the stuff like this. So here's, for example, a quick story. Um, a lot of the books are about what is motherhood, how is stepmotherhood different, because I've been that. How is an adoptive mother different? Here's the story about that, and here's where it came from. I was picking up my daughter who grew up, actually stopped nursing, which was the beginning of the end in my opinion, but in any event, <laughs> goes to college in Boston. I have to pick her up. Have you picked your kid up at school? Like You have to get all their stuff in the car and take it home. And I'm still single, so it's me and her. Like Our Thanksgiving is two people, <laughs> whatever. And uh, we get all the stuff in the car. She's got shoes, books, DVDs. She's got earrings. The parents of sons, they have like baseball caps and a basketball, but I have, I have everything. I've packed the car. On top of the car, I have a mattress, a box spring, a red rug, which she insists on keeping from her dorm room, $37 rug. I said, let's toss it. She's like, no, I really want to keep it. I, I deny her nothing. We strap this thing with the bungee cards. Right, it's a nightmare. We drive home from Boston to Philadelphia. In Connecticut, the worst rainstorm ever in the history of rainstorms happened. And the red rug, those of you who do laundry will know exactly what happens next, because the red rug, believe I'm driving the blood mobile. I had a white car, and red is leeching all over my car. It looks like Stephen King. I don't, I don't know what color plasma is, but I'm pretty sure it was in my windshield, like a thin red yellow gruel, kind of revolting. People on I-95 are pointing and laughing, who are these completely crazy broads, honestly. And we're laughing. And at that moment, I think to myself, this is. This is so wonderful because we basically laugh through the next three states. And I go, I am not going to have this very much. Many, many more years because she's growing up and she's going to graduate. And, she, you know, there's a joke that says that what is the difference between an Italian mother and a Rottweiler? And they say, eventually, the Rottweiler lets go. <laughs> I don't think it's about Italianness. I think it's about all good moms and it's about all good dads. You can't let them go. And I was got all, we had this great talk in the car, and I remember picking her up. You've had probably good talks with your kids in the car, right? There's something about the car, right? It's a little therapy on wheels where they can't get out. You know, like, she, I always say it's like wonderful, and she always says it's a cage match. So there's a difference. And <laughs> in any event, I get home, and I have this moment where all of my emotions well up, which is a lot of emotion, as you can see. And I, uh, I think to myself, I'm going to have to let her go, and this is going to be hard. And then the next thought I had was, you, she, you're supposed to be a lawyer, Scottolini. You framed the question wrong. She is not yours to let go. You don't own her. Poof, your analysis is all wrong. And as soon as I thought about that, I felt better in my heart. I felt lighter. I was like, I can do this now because I'm not letting her go. And I said, that's a novel. That novel was Look Again. 
That's what's really happening in Look Again. That's the emotional truth of Look Again. But the top line plot, the stupid missing staircase, well, I shouldn't say stupid about my own books, but you, you're working with me. Um, <laughs> the, the top line plot is a woman. Oh, let me get this straight, doesn't matter. Fake blonde from the Pennsylvania suburbs. I'm the only person I ever write about. Let's, we understand that now. Uh, she comes home one day, and she gets a card in the mail from missing and abducted children. And she looks at the picture in the middle. Looks exactly like her three-year-old son, who was adopted. Because in doing my research, I learned that it's, a it's practically true in every jurisdiction in this country that you can put up a baby for adoption without producing evidence or proof that it is yours. You can't get out of Nordstrom's writing a check unless you show them your mortgage papers, but you can say, this is my baby. And they're fine with that. So you know what's going to happen on the first page of Look Again, because readers are smart. And they say, well, listen, this woman is going to learn right then that there, or suspect that there is something wrong with her adoption, unbeknownst to her. And she's going to start to think to herself, if I do the research to find the truth, I may lose my child. But if I keep the secret, I keep my child. The question, and look again, is who owns a child? And it came from the emotional truth of that crappy $37 red rug. <laughs> now, what is all this? And we write these emotions, we write, before I move on, we write the humorous ones in the summer, which are about literal truth. And frankly, they're about the literal truth of a woman's life. So I write in all things as a representative capacity. I got the idea for writing those because I loved Irma Bombeck. And I thought, where's Irma Bombeck? Where are the women's voices that are listened to that are about just domestic issues? Why just? Why just? Why do we give that second? Why is that such short shrift? And it had been bothering me. But I, did, I didn't think I could try to write those things because I felt like I had a kind of a funny family. Like I said, like we're like the Thanksgiving, like there's no husband. It's me and a daughter. It's kind of weird. And I, um, so I, did, I felt distinctly uh, inept, unworthy. This is my favorite emotion, generally, insecure. <laughs> so I'm at a library fundraiser at Laguna Niguel. Laguna Niguel is a very fancy place in California. And I, I sort of said something like I'm divorced twice, which is not something I used to lead with. Now I'm a little lower. <laughs> Everything loosens up as you get 60, you're like, whatever. <laughs> We'll all live. I'm in Laguna Niguel. I hear people going, oh, I'm divorced four times. No, I'm divorced five times. Like, I need to move to Laguna Niguel. But what was interesting is I heard these women start talking instantly about what? Dogs. Their dogs. And the woman who were divorced four times had four dogs, and the woman who were divorced five times had five. And I'm like, well, I, I have five dogs and two divorces, so I'm clearly behind. I got room. I got room. It's awesome. But when I listened to them, I thought, you can write that now. Whoa. Got very Italian on you. <laughs> Brian, I almost killed myself right off the thing. Um, you can write this. Because the truth is, not everybody has that family. You're lucky if you have that nice nuclear thing we all grow up with. But you know what? There's a lot of people who are divorced. Sadly, there's a lot of people who are widowed. And there's all kinds of families. And we're all smarter than that now. And so I said, what I really think is happening with these women and these dogs is that women are making themselves happy. That Maybe there isn't a guy around loving you or another woman around loving you, but you can give love and you have, your heart is full of love and it doesn't know the difference. Like if it were that smart, it would be your brain. That's what I figured out myself. <laughs> right? So I wrote a book called Why My Third Husband Will Be a Dog, which is about the real life of me and my daughter and my mother. But I think it is really, more importantly, about you. My secret mission is for you to get the credit you deserve. And if I said that on the cover, they wouldn't buy the book. I'd tell them it's an entertaining story, and it kind of is. So they get the secret message that women can do really cool things, and they can do funny things, and they can live their lives however they want to, and they can drive their roadster wherever they damn please, all by themselves. Because I do believe that even if you're lucky enough to have somebody with you in your passenger seat, or even driving you around, you know, you're still on this road of life a little bit alone. In the end, you gotta be, you gotta stand up for yourself. And so that's what I'm secretly writing about. Now, to finish, 
I have sort of made a big point about this truth. Writers always do that. I don't think they explain why that matters. And that's where you come in. The reason it matters if it's true is because that's the only way it connects. I always think to myself when I'm writing the funny books, if it doesn't make me cringe, it won't make you laugh. So I wrote about, for example, finding my first gray hair on my chin and realizing I was turning into an Amish man. <laughs> I don't really want to tell you that, but I have to tell you that because then you know what I'm talking about. Like, I was in the hotel room mirror. I looked. I plucked for you, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> and that shows how much I love you. And so we do that for And so you want to write about a woman getting older on her terms, whatever they are. I don't have all the answers. Obviously, I'm trying to figure it out. But it's true. And if it's true, it connects. And that is why the arts matter. And that is why, specifically, books matter. Because when you look at our society that is so atomized, truly, like perfect, like we're like, pfft, we're everywhere. We used to have office coolers. When I was a lawyer, we all went to the desk. We all talked to our secretary. We all had our little place that we convened. Not everybody has that anymore. We're all blah, 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 right? And da, 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 da. And we can't look commute and we're Skyping. But at the time, at the same time that we are farther apart than ever, or alone together, as I saw on the train today, everybody like this, the thing that is growing is book clubs. Book clubs. And you have to understand that that's the reason. The reason is because people want to be together. They want to share their thing. They want to open up. So when I open up emotionally, I want to tell you something really true. What it's like to know you're getting older. What it's like to lose your mother. What it's like to lose your kid. What it's like when your kid gets beat up in New York City and you want to kill somebody, but you're not sure who. Or, or the good things. When you get a date, it actually kind of works out, at least until the third time. Whatever it is, all the stuff of it, all the lawyers, stand up in front, get a case, figure out what it is to be a mother, what it is to be a stepmother, how are those things different? All of those things, if I can just open up and tell it true, it will connect with you. That's what books do, and that's why books matter. So that when I, and I know the proof of it is, because when I go to any book club meeting, because I'm still, they'll invite me sometimes, and I'll go, because there's wine. <laughs> Hi, I'm the author. And um, this is what happens. The first five minutes are always like, oh, in the Rosado Law Firm, this and that. And they ask me questions. I try to remember the book. I always wrote the book a, a year ago. I, can't, no, I just make it up. I never remember anything. But the next 15, well, that's not really true, but it's hard for me to remember. But the next 15 minutes are all about this. They start talking about themselves, their, their grandkids, their kids, their, their new kitchen reno. And then what will happen is the same thing which is that some woman will invariably look up, because women apologize constantly, and a woman is going to apologize to me, and she's going to say, I'm sorry. We're supposed to be talking about your book. And I say the same thing, which is absolutely true. And sometimes I even get choked up when I say it. I say, but you are. When you talk about what part of a book you love or what part you hate, you're talking about yourself and your own truth. When you talk about what authors you love and what authors you hate, or what authors you love, or why you love a book, why does it matter? These book clubs have been together for 10 and 20 years, and women are in book clubs more than one. Who here is in a book club? Anybody? Of course, right? How many of 10 years standing? More than one. I, I'm writing Rosado for you because you are seeing those relationships, as I see with my best friends. Those relationships change over time, and you are sharing that intimacy over time, and I don't think it happens without a book. That's why the truth matters, and that's why the arts matter. And that's why it's so wonderful that John does everything he does for the center of the book in all of the 50 states, and why I remember meeting him, and why he said, will you come here? And I was like, yes. Why it's amazing and great that Laura Bush started it. Why it's amazing and great that the Obamas continued it and supported it why the National Book Festival makes a statement. Look, we can all talk about kids' literacy and lots of, that's such good work that many of you are doing with kids' literacy, but I don't want to forget about adults because I feel like we have all of us, and particularly women, but that's maybe, you know, we're always doing so much for everybody else. 
We always have the, uh, I always think of the timeline in the back of our head. Gee, what my kid right now, for example, is finishing her dinner, and then I'm going to call her at 10 o'clock. And if you have more than one kid, and how you did that, I don't know. <laughs> Props to you. You know all their schedules, or you know your mother's schedule, or you know it's time for somebody to take their medicine, and you know that that's every four hours. You know it. Women carry so much of this that I want, I love that the National Book Festival says to adults, take time to read. Books matter. At the national level, at a national statement, we are saying not only for kids, but for adults too. Because I know and I read constantly, thanks to libraries, that if I spend an hour reading on the internet, and believe me, I waste time. Perez Hilton, Gawker, Twitter, I'm on Facebook, and I tweeted about this, I took a picture, I was me, hey, come see me. I love, th I love that. But if you read for an hour on the, online, and then you read an hour, a novel, you will feel a difference in your soul, right? Because books nurture you, books heal you, books glue you one to the other. That's what matters. And that's why you matter, because you are bringing literacy. I cannot believe it. When John was showing me this brochure, which is gorgeous, by the way, that you are doing that worldwide for people. I don't know how you bring about peace and love and justice any other way. Books teach empathy. That's the whole message of To Kill a Mockingbird. If you walk in somebody else's shoes, that's how you really understand them. And any time you read a book, you are exercising empathy because you're in, as Ann Beattie says, a unified consciousness of another soul for 400 pages. And if they're going to write it true and write it honest and really open up their heart, you're going to feel their soul. And I'm going to feel yours. You. I do that on the micro level because I get to write them. But you are doing something so amazing and so valuable. And believe it or not, though I might not look like the kids in your countries, I am the kids in your countries. I was that kid. I'm a kid from South Philly. And I never would have had a chance but for what you do, for literacy, for libraries, for all of us, for the arts, for justice, for peace, and for love. That's true. I think that's true. Anyway, thank you. You. Look at me. I got carried away. Vote for me. It's that time of year. <laughs> Now, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Otherwise, you can go live your lives. <laughs> Look, I have no estrogen left. Yet, I am schwitzing. Please. That's so nice here. Thank you. And are you single? <laughs> I could have told you that. Any other questions or wonderful comments? Yes, Robert, my favorite person. Right. Other writers that you like, and what might be on your nightstand right now? Oh my God. Well, I read really widely because that's all I do. I mean, I, I have no social life at this point, but I'm kind of <laughs> happy. It's imaginary. Um, I love all the thriller people because I love. I think these are stories about crime and punishment, and I don't think they're. You know, I just love them. So I love like Baldacci. Um, I love uh, Louise Penny. I love Jody Picoult. I love um, uh, Charles Todd's wonderful, uh, Harlan Coben. Uh, I also read a lot of nonfiction because I'm writing memoir. So David Sedaris is like, I love. <laughs> Augustine Burroughs, I love. Uh, Mary Carr. Um, I just read a lot. I, just, I think if it's out there, I kind of read it. Lee Child. I mean, I just think somebody who is really uh, stretching and trying to do what I said that I'm trying to do. I mean, how lucky are we? And I feel like there's so many more books that there ever were before, even self-published books. I'm so happy that there's so many avenues for people to have a voice that there weren't when I started writing 24 years ago. Yes? Well, it's about lawyers. <laughs> Elizabeth? <laughs> I mean, the sh in long story short, it is actually because I was very, um, I did not know anything about juvenile justice. And I started to think more and more about justice issues. 
And there was particularly a scandal that happened in Pennsylvania, which long story short was called Kids for Cash, where what happened, and this is exactly how it happened 13 years ago, if you were a child in Luzerne County, Pennsylvania, and you got into a fight in a cafeteria, you went or were adjudicated, what did you say? Yes, you were adjudicated delinquent. You went right to prison. Without counsel, there was a waiver form that was created and you, it was, you were railroaded. It turns out that that was actually because no one knew it, that there was a real life judicial corruption scheme where that these two state court judges were in cahoots with the builder of the prison and said, if you uh, basically they had the part ownership there. So there was a secret deal that went on, which was you send us the kids, give us a quota of kids and we'll send you money back those judges were ultimately convicted of uh, theft of honest services and income tax evasion, are serving 17 and 28 years respectively. But I said to myself, because I'm not gonna, I can't write that. I, don't, I never do that rip from the headline stuff. I was much more interested in what happens to the 7,000 kids who that happened to? And what was it like to be Benny Rosado? And the amazing story behind this, by the way, it was a woman founder of the Juvenile Law Center Marsha Levick, who broke this whole case, because and what Benny does comes to it much, much later. When Benny, if you go back in time, Benny's representing a kid who basically in the cafeteria gets sent to prison. She can't figure out how this happened. She tries to undo it. It's plainly unconstitutional, but she keeps losing and doesn't know why. And so it's the case that haunts her. You, prob you might have, as a lawyer, the case that haunts you. I have the case that haunts me. It just bugs me. Still, 25 years, I should have said this. I should have said that. I do that all the time. I'll do it tonight in the hotel room. Ah, when I said that, I shouldn't have said crowning. That was really weird. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens with Benny in short, that, of course, what I wanted to explore is what happens to these kids who basically had their entire lives derailed, spent three and four years in juvenile incarceration, which is no joke incarceration, at the time when their adolescent brains were forming, so I had the research on that, and how were they ruined and how can they be made whole? A Philadelphia law firm about a year ago tried to get them reparations. They got them about $5,000 a piece. Is your child's health and welfare and very soul worth more than $5,000? Of course, but it's the best they could do. So I said, here's Benny. She, that kid is, of course, going to grow up to become an offender of some type. He's accused of murder. Benny finds herself in the position of defending him. She get, it's her second chance. The book is a little bit about second chances. And by the way, she's in love. She fell in love 13 years ago. The guy comes back. You know, he's the one who got away. And yes, I wrote a sex scene for you from memory. And I, <laughs> I know, I know. So you get the idea. It's sort of the case of her life and the man of her dreams all at once. Don't you hate when that happens? That's corrupted. Thank you. Anything else? Yes, please. I love how you said um, your family just deeply loved you but didn't understand you. Yeah. A program with kids in jail who are like right. secret losers. It's so sad to me. Like they can't tell their family that they're going to the library. What can you tell them to like, you know, try to change the culture of the reading? It's like it's okay that I'm a nerd and I'm going to the library. And, it's know, really like, hard. I mean, you know, I get the flip side of that because I donate a lot of books to prisons. I also then I got some flack so because from the police academy said so why are you you're giving to the bad guys you're giving to the good guys I'm like well I don't really think of it that way but so now I donate everywhere there's Republicans and there's Democrats you gotta like them both they're in trouble so uh, but I get the same thing from inmates and I, the only thing I can say and I think you have a I don't know but I think you have a leg up with kids because I feel like Harry Potter changed the world you know right because it became a movie too. If I talk in schools, and I try to, for the reason that Christy and I were talking about, I want them to go, you know, uh, I was you, and you can write a book, honey. Like, that's how, and I'll tell you how it gets made. The first question they always have, is it going to be a movie? <laughs> Happily, my last one is going to be. I'm like, yay. But, but I guess what I'm trying to say is, because it's a movie, this sounds horrible, but I think that that gave kids credibility. When I have a lot of moms who will say to me, um, how do I get my kid to read? I said, show them a Harry Potter movie, and then tell them it came from a book. And what sort of happens is, and they get, they get lost, then the kids find the books. If you gotta do it that way, because I do think there's a norm, we all know about bullying and peer group pressure, and you can't, you know, it's hard to say, you know, it's okay to geek out, but I do that, 
and um, for a while I was giving, I had a bunch of books, I had a bunch of buttons. Actually, I was given one by Ron Charles of the Washington Post, the book editor, who's the greatest guy ever. And he gave me his button that said, I like big books and I cannot lie. <laughs> and so I, I bought a bunch of them. And then when I went to a school and I gave that out, and the kid's like, yeah. And I'm like, so how do you tell reading is not only fundamental but cool? Um, it's like, just keep trying. That's how I look at it. But I do think children's literature has been so much lately YA, young adult, to movie that you almost have a better shot. You almost have a shot. Because we give a lot of credibility to movies. Someday we'll give the same credibility to books. Or at least we do in this room. Hearing no other questions, thank you so very much for all you do. Thank you, Lisa. That was great. Thanks, folks. I didn't know what was coming, but it was wonderful. <laughs> uh, we now have a book signing of Corrupted, which is for sale as of today, published today. And make sure that she dates that book and you remember that you were here on the publication date. But I also want to say that uh, thank you so much to everyone who came tonight and thanks especially to our best practices people. It's really, for the board members who are still here, and there are some, uh, it's really been a wonderful day. And uh, we've topped it off with some entertainment, but something quite serious if you think about it and experience it. So I think we've come full circle. Uh, thank you. Uh, we will go to the book signing if you like. And we will be back in touch with the best practices people. Jill is here. And we've been at you all day, moving you around and getting you to sign things. But uh, we promise to be back and to have a continuing relationship through the Center for the Book and our partnership program. So in many ways, it's the beginning. But it's been a terrific day, and I thank you all. And uh, I will still be here to talk with some of you. We haven't had a chance to chat, but uh, thanks for everything. And uh, we hope that uh, we see some of you soon back at the Library of Congress. So I will say good night. And Jill, well, let, let, me, let me publicly thank Jill also for the support. Let's give Jill a hand. She really. Uh, We've been very flexible. Uh, one of our board members said you've had to turn on a dime. We had a quick change in our arrangements, but it's all worked out beautifully. Thanks to everybody. And, and Jill, thanks again. See you all outside. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.